Trump taking heat for questioning the integrity of the election. How do you feel about the election? How should you feel? How should you feel about the future? I'm going to tell you all that coming up next. I tell history stories every single day. Not really on here, but on my radio show. I got a radio show. Every day I tell a story about history. And because I talk about history so much, I have people ask me all the time. Because I'm always talking about battles or explorers or wars or famine or whatever happened. People ask me all the time, who's the greatest general of all time? Everybody wants to know, right? It answers to these historical questions. And then you can argue about it. Well, what about this battle? What about that battle? It's fun. Well, you know what I answer most of the time? Well, general for what? General for what? What do I want him to do? You see, there are different people made for different things, even in the same profession. God made us all different. And this guy isn't necessarily good at what this guy does. And what this guy does isn't necessarily what this guy does. The problem we run into is people don't think this way. People think everybody should be good at everything, or the person who's bad at this is bad as everything. That's not how life works. You ask me who the greatest general is? Well, what is he doing? Is he designing an entire military campaign? I don't know. That's probably going to be Napoleon or Genghis Khan. Does he have to win one battle? Well, that would probably be any one of Genghis Khan's general, may, generals. Maybe that would be George Patton. Maybe that would be Zhukov. Maybe it could be Hannibal Barca. I, I don't know. But there are not sexy parts of war, too. What's the general have to do? What if, he, what if he's supposed to lay out a base, a military base, and come up with a logistical system to supply the troops with water and food? Very important. Well, then it probably wouldn't be any of those generals. In fact, none of those generals would probably want the job. They'd probably be bored to tears. Different people are made for different things. And I'm wrapping my mind around something when it comes to our side. Not with the left, but with our side. I'm wrapping my mind around this. We have, and it's probably because of just the GOP's nature, the nature of the right, our values, whatever it may be, we have a serious lack of fight in us. And it's not that, it's not that, it's not that we're not brave. It's not a courage thing. This is a, I just want to be left alone. I don't want politics to rule my life thing. I just want to go to work, worship, fun, and just, you know, do politics on the weekends whenever I think it's an important thing. And you know what? I like living that way. I live my life that way. I talk politics for four hours a day between radio and TV. And when I get off, I don't run home and just turn on the television and put through all the political news. I'm reading, I'm, play, I'm playing basketball with my sons, I'm watching history documentaries, I'm doing a million things that aren't political. I get it, you wanna compartmentalize your life. But that's our mentality, and therefore, we're not ready. We have a lifetime of not being ready for what's happening right now with this election. The election was Tuesday night, it's now Friday. Uh, forgetting, forgetting what the leftists are doing. We'll get to that in a minute. It's now Friday. Half of my political friends, politicians, pundits, and others, at least half, I was doing some browsing on what people were saying today, are already saying things like, oh, just give it up for the good of the country. Oh, you know what? I just want all this to be over. Have you seen this out there? I just want it to be over. Wait, what? You want it to be over. You want to win or you're a loser. There's no, I just want it to be over unless you're willing to just lay down and take it. And I have had this epiphany today. I think the GOP needs to gather up a bunch of money together. And like several societies have throughout history, we need to hire our fighters. I think we need to hire hardcore leftists. Now, I don't want you to live like the hardcore leftist does. We've had this talk before, you and I, on the show. You can't go to a neighborhood party and throw some horseshoes with the fellas on July 4th without the, without the neighborhood Democrat coming up. Have you seen what Trump did? I mean, just, oh, gosh, leave me alone with that. 
However, that miserable human being who can't ever turn it off, you know what they haven't said one time since Tuesday on Election Day? Not one time has a leftist in this country said, I'm, I'm sick of it. Let's just let Trump have it. I'm just tired of all the fighting. It doesn't enter their mentality. You know, we can despise the leftists. We can despise the left. But we can also choose to admire the things they are good at. They're better at these fights than we are. I see it everywhere. I'm done. Ah, oh, it's too stressful. <laughs> if we're talking about the presidency of the United States of America. It is important. It's kind of a big deal. And forgetting about domestically, you know what, set, set you and I aside for a minute. Forgetting taxes and general direction of the culture and things like that. Do you know the Venezuelans are looking at our election and praying to God that Donald Trump wins because they know Joe Biden won't hold Maduro, hold, hold Maduro to account? You know the communist Chinese are already making public statements saying, oh, thank goodness it looks like Joe Biden's going to win. You realize how many people they're destroying in that country of their own people and others? The world, people around the world know this election matters. You and I can't buck up for a few weeks, a month, and figure out what's legitimate and what's not? I'm floored by what I've seen. Ah, oh, it's just, uh, stop saying it's not fair. That's so stupid. What? Let's be something clear. Let's be real clear about what is real and what is not real right now. No, every vote cast for Joe Biden was not a fraudulent vote done in the dark of night to give Joe Biden the election. That's ridiculous to say that. But saying things like, oh, there was no voter fraud. Ah, that is equally, if not more naive. We know there was voter fraud because there's always voter fraud in every election. And to say otherwise means you're either willingly naive or you have no idea what happens at local levels. You have no idea of the corruption of big city politics. These big cities and counties it's uglier than anything you've ever seen on television. It happens. What we don't know, what we must figure out before we decide who the next president's going to be is how big of a deal was it? If 100 votes came in illegally from jo for Joe Biden, okay, the country picked Joe Biden, no big deal, he's the next president. If 100,000 came in for Joe Biden, now we have a very big deal on our hands and it's something we have to work out. That's something we're not going to know until we look into it. And I am sick to death of the people on our side. Not the leftists, frankly, you know, as much as I dislike them, frankly, I admire them. Like I said, I haven't seen one of them tired of the fight. Not one. It's our own side that kills us in these things every single time. <laughs> I'm tired of it. I'm tired of our own people not bucking up, wearing down. Ah, oh, let's just move on. Buddy, this is the presidency of the United States of America. And whether Donald Trump gets reelected or not, the culture of the United States of America is turning to rotten filth, not worth saving. We have to hold on to these positions of power to attempt to get some wins and get it going the other direction. Stop being weak. Start caring. Donald Trump's up there saying stuff like this, and it may make you uncomfortable. So I don't even love it. It's better than laying down. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. We want every legal vote counted, and I want every legal vote counted. We want openness and transparency, no secret count rooms, no mystery ballots, no illegal votes being cast after Election Day. We think there's going to be a lot of litigation because we have so much evidence, so much proof, and it's going to end up perhaps at the highest court in the land. We'll see. But we think there'll be a lot of litigation because we can't have an election stolen by, by like this.
Those are heavy words. Okay, well, I hear those words and I think, all right, well, we're going to have to see the evidence, right? We're going to have to see it. I can understand why they wouldn't reveal it, yet this goes to the courts now and the lawyers, but all right, they say they have it. I'm assuming we're going to see it. I mean, and let's, let's be aware of something here. Let's remember something. I'm not trying to do that tit for tat thing, but they impeached this president off of nothing. They put him through a two-year Russian collusion special investigation over what turned out to be nothing. You're going to have to excuse me if I don't expect Donald Trump to be Mr. Merciful and, well, I'm just going to concede it now. I don't blame him one bit. Instead, we have people like Adam Kinzinger saying things like this. We want every vote counted. Yes, every legal vote. If there are legitimate concerns about fraud, present evidence, take it to court. Oh, present evidence, sorry. Take it to court. Stop spreading debunked misinfo. Oh, okay. And then we have Heard, this freaking guy of Texas. Heard says this. A sitting president undermining our political process and questioning the legality of, of the voices of countless Americans without evidence is not only dangerous and wrong, it undermines the very foundation this nation was built upon. Every American should have his or vote counted. Nobody has said otherwise. Why are we always conceding? And why, outside of these guys, outside of these guys who are being vocal about tr telling Trump just to shut up and go away, where are the other Republicans in, in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, stepping up and saying, let's dig into all this right now and find out what's what? I'm not saying you all have to run to the cameras and say, stolen election. I don't know that it was stolen. You don't know that it was stolen. But there's certainly enough out there that we need to find out, right? Instead, we're already conceding. You know why? because of what I talked about in the very beginning. Because these guys, Kinzinger, Heard, they just want things to be quiet again. They don't want to win. I don't even think about that. Their mind doesn't work that way. They want things to be quiet. They want things to just, just be calm. I just, I, I just want to get from my car to my congressional office without getting asked about Donald Trump. That's really what I want. It's not about winning things for America. I just want things to be calm. Now's the time to fight. Now's the time to find out. We know some things happened. We don't have any idea how much. We must find out. How is that controversial? Trump sends out a tweet, quote, so now the Democrats are working to gain control of the U.S. Senate through their actions on John James, David Perdue, and more would end the filibuster, life, Second Amendment, and would pack and rotate the court. Presidency becomes even more important. We will win. Oh, yeah, did I mention? There's still a chance we lose control of the U.S. Senate. But, hey, I, I know they're tired. I know, I just want it all to quiet down and go away. It's all right. It's only, that. It's only the presidency and the Senate. It's not that important. Let's give them all three branches of government. See how that works. Joe Biden, crafty devil came out and said this, just be patient. Senator and I, we continue to feel very good about where things stand. We have no doubt that when the count is finished, Senator Harris and I will be declared the winners. So I ask everyone to stay calm, all the people to stay calm. The process is working. The count is being completed and uh, we'll know very soon. So thank you all for your patience, but we have to count the votes. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Oh, the process most definitely is working. That is for sure. It ain't a process that's good for you or me, but the process is working. Like I said, I think we need to hire more of them. We need people like that. I mean, we don't want to hang out with them, obviously, but we need people who go all in all the time. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. Now, you know what else should make you uncomfortable? The guaranteed tax increase that's about to come if things don't go the right way. You know why that should make you uncomfortable? Not that I think you're filthy rich. Maybe you are if you are good for you. Um, 
we need employers hiring people in this country. We need the stock market to stay strong because people have so much of their retirement invested in stocks and bonds. But we also need to be smart, right? Don't we? We need to raise the floor of how low things can go if things go bad. Get a gold IRA from Gold Alliance and make sure you have raised your floor. Go to goldalliance.com slash jesse. That's goldalliance.com slash jesse. Get a gold IRA and get it today. We'll be back. There are good things that have come out of this election. No matter how it turns out, there are good things. And one of the good things that has happened over the last four years, not necessarily just this election, is the parties have realigned. Uh, As you know, because you can hear me talk every single night, I am not necessarily formally educated. I went to community college. I come from a construction family. I just get along well with working class people. I eat Red Lobster all the time. Those are my people. And for a while, under the GOP, it wasn't really a working class party. And I hated that the Democrats had that. They were that lunch pail party, and I didn't like it. And those days are gone now. And that is a very, very, very good thing. The Democrat Party has become the party of the uber wealthy, tech billionaire, coastal elites. And Donald Trump, to his credit, realized, man, the working class people should be our people. And what he said here, 100 percent true. They spent almost $200 million on Senate races in South Carolina and Kentucky alone, two races. And hundreds of millions of dollars overall against us. At the national level, our opponents' major donors were Wall Street bankers and special interests. Our major donors were police officers, farmers, everyday citizens. Yet for the first time ever, we lost zero races in the House. That's true. There are things to feel good about. Parties realign themselves all the time. If the GOP is going to realign itself and stop being the Wall Street party and start being the lunch pill party, that is a good thing, not a bad thing. And I'm not anti-Wall Street guy, anti-rich guy. I hope every one of you goes and makes as much money as you can. But for a long time, and I still see some elements of this in the GOP, I saw these GOPers looking down their nose at people like that thumbing their nose at people like that and the things they care about. And I don't dig that at all. And I'm glad we're changing that because the Democrat Party, I mean, look, I, I, assuming you're not a hardcore conservative, but you're a, you're a steel worker in the Rust Belt. You, you relate to this Democrat Party? Joe Biden up there telling you that uh, your son can choose to be a girl if he wants. You relate to that? Defund the police. Does that, that connect with you? Better close down that steel, mill, that, that steel mill for Mother Earth. That drive home for you? No, it doesn't. They left these guys, and I'm glad we're picking them up. And, you know, media conduct, obviously, has not been good, to put it mildly, over the last four years. But over the past week, past few days since this election, man, do these people understand how hated they are? And they understand it gets worse from here, right? I see clips like this, and I don't think they understand. We have never seen, really, other than, well, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this from a president of the United States. And uh, I think, as Jake said, it is, it's sad, and it is truly pathetic. And, of course, it is dangerous, and, of course, it will go to courts. But you'll notice the president did not have any evidence presented at all, nothing no real actual evidence uh, of any kind of fraud. Talked about people putting up papers in windows. He talked about things that he'd seen on the internet. That is the president of the United States. That is the most powerful person in the world. And we see him like an obese turtle on his back, flailing in the hot sun, realizing his time is over. But he just hasn't accepted it, and he wants to take everybody down with him, including this country. (laughs) How many shows did Anderson Cooper do on Russian collusion? We allowed to ask that? Was that dangerous? Because I remember two years of Anderson Cooper and a lot of people 
saying the President of the United States of America was basically a Russian agent in cahoots with Vladimir Putin. Turned out none of that was true. That wasn't dangerous? Just asking questions here. And The View, what's her name, Sonny Huston, Sonny Houston? I'm glad about clips like this. I love to know what they actually think. For the past four years, this president has shown us that he is a misogynist, that he is homophobic, that he is uh, racist, and that he can that he mismanaged a, a, a coronavirus pandemic to the tune of over 250,000 American deaths. Yet 50% of America right. saw all of that and looked the other way to their brothers and their sisters and said, I'm going to vote for him anyway. I'm not going to say that 50% of Americans are racist and sexist and, and, and homophobic, but I will say that that tells me that they will look the other way to that kind of behavior, to the plight of their fellow Americans if personally they feel that they are right. doing okay and that they will do better under that uh, that right. type of presidency. And that, I think, is despicable. It is un-American. I like knowing what they think. I like it. Keep it up. Keep it up. All right. Let me tell you what cyber criminals are thinking. They're thinking, wow, these home titles, they're all online now. And getting my hands on them is really, really, really easy. I think I'll do that more. Are they looking at yours as we speak? I don't know. I don't know. And the point is, you don't know either. And that's part of why this crime is so bad. It's easy for them to pull off, and you don't know about it until it's too late, until it's way too late. Go to HomeTitleLock.com right now and sign up. In fact, go to HomeTitleLock.com, register your address, see if you're already a victim of home title theft. You might be. While you're there, use the promo code RADIO. Get 30 days of free protection. 30 days. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code RADIO. We'll be back. Joining me now, National Security Analyst Dave Reboy. Dave, I am not shocked, but just absolutely furious at the people on our side who are already saying things like, I'm tired, just let's move on, let's forget about this whole thing. Why can't we develop the left's fighter mentality and keep our own values? Are, th are those two things incompatible? Because I haven't seen one leftist say, I'm just tired, let's just move on. Right. Well, it just it, it's fine how it happens to coincide the, pe the people who are tired and ready to move on and think, you know, Trump should concede are the same people that hated him to begin with. And uh, and this is a scenario that that they've been kind of salivating for 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 years, which is a Mitch McConnell led establishment Republican Party in the Senate and uh, and um, and, you know, Biden in the White House, uh, Pelosi in um, in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, this is basically an excuse for them to go back to business as usual, which is, hey, let's do nothing. Okay, so that's really what we want, right? And, and let me ask you something, Dave. I realize the, there's this never Trump contingent that were, they were really loud about it, the Lincoln Project and things like that. But I get this sense, because of the silence of so many of our elected officials on the right, I get this sense that there are a lot of elected GOPers, maybe even vocal Trump supporters over the past few years, who were excited to have him gone because they want a quiet walk from the office to the car. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, exactly right. There are never Trump Republicans. There's there's a tiny, tiny sliver of them who who are still loud. You know, they're not really Republicans in in any way, really anymore, uh, other than just for kind of advertising purposes and branding purposes. But uh, there is, as you say, a much bigger crowd of folks who just kind of kept their head down, stopped shouting about Trump but nevertheless have tried to undermine him the whole step of the way. Okay, so we 
what happens to the gains we have made as a party as far as things that, I mean, not necessarily a party platform. I mean, look, in my opinion, if Trump turns out to have lost this thing, and, and I'm not exceedingly hopeful right now because it's going to the courts and I don't trust the courts, but if it turns out Trump's lost, where is the party now? Does it revert back? Was this purely a Trump phenomenon or has the base changed? Has the party values changed? Yeah, I think the base has changed. I think we're we're in a moment where uniquely in American history, or maybe not uniquely, but uh, but it happens once every so often that um, that a new party can arise now and you know from from ashes of uh, of an old party. I think we're at that point now because we have a Republican party that still stubbornly clings to the image of itself that kind of existed between let's say 1992 and uh and and uh and and the advent of Donald Trump which is you know which is a a platform of priorities that kind of have been overtaken by events in many ways and uh we we assumed that a lot of people assumed that the GOP platform was um you know was like the 10 commandments you know the the uncreated word of God, as the as the um, uh, as the uh, as the Quran would be, and um, we're in a different time, and we need something new. You know the the uh, the Trump emphasis on the middle of the country, the Trump emphasis on on trade and on how really the most uh, you know most of these policies, the economic. Or, or you know, philosophical, or social media, or, or whatever, they come down hardest on the middle class, and they come down hardest not on elites, but uh, but on kind of regular people, and that's the party that Trump created, and that's the party that's not going anywhere, and I think smarter people, um, smarter people now after this uh, election victory, and especially how well uh, Trump did with um, you know with with different minorities. Of kind of every every stripe, um, I think the smart people are looking at it now and saying, "How can we get this plus what we used to have?" I don't think it's possible to get this plus what we used to have. So there's a tremendous opportunity now for someone to come in and 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 be sort of um, you know version version 2.0. But um, at least as far as the infrastructure goes, as far as leadership, I mean, you know, Donald Trump is is still here. You know, he's he's not going anywhere. But I really think that right now is the perfect moment to build an infrastructure around him that does not include, you know, the Kasichs, you know, the um, the, the the Rick Wilsons, the you know, frankly, the Marco Rubios, the um, you know, the Mitt Romneys, et cetera. Okay, you mentioned the GOP platform not being good enough anymore, or at least what it was not being good enough anymore. I'm paraphrasing. What part? What part of the platform, and why isn't it good enough? Well, I agree with you. I just want you to elaborate. Sure. I mean, it it depends really what what you're talking about. I mean, in my in my particular uh, uh, bag of, of foreign affairs and and, and foreign policy. Uh, what that really means is a repudiation of kind of ruling class, uh, you know, ruling class national security doctrine over the past, you know, several decades. And it spans from Republican to Democrat. Now, a lot of people kind of make that shorthand and they say no more endless wars. Well, yes, we agree, no more endless wars. Um, Many Americans, I think, are rightly furious that, you know, not really that that we got into the wars in the first place, but the fact that we let them drag on and the fact that our, our leadership allowed them to drag on with no end, with no resolution, no victory, nothing, and it seemed to be fine for most of the ruling class. That seemed to be an arrangement that could go on indefinitely. Oh, we can be in Afghanistan for 50 years. Why not? Sure. Uh, with with no goals, with no I mean, with no with no anything. Um, so that needs to end on on one hand. On the other hand, is you know sort of the flip side of that coin is the fact that rather than assert ourselves in the Middle East 
and help our allies. What we spent time doing under George Bush and under Barack Obama and under the ruling class was to say, you know what, the problem with was it was basically to to uh, to psychoanalyze and and um, and uh, and and bring this into like a sociology class. So we said, you know what, the problem with you guys is you guys don't have democracy. You guys don't have a political process. Let's you know, let's make sure that you do. And what we ended up doing was we ended up creating a policy where we would destabilize the regions that were actually pro-American and 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 liked us and bring to power uh, Islamist regimes that would work against us. And this is we this is what we did on a bipartisan way. I mean, I can think of kind of no better poster boy for this than John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Uh, they did this in Syria. They did this in Libya. They did this in you know I mean you know anywhere you can think of. They were they were ready to to send in money and troops and help you know any number of Islamist bad guy rebels. And this is this is the kind of stuff that needs to stop. You know uh, a a bipartisan uh, obsession with Russia and Putin at the expense of dealing with China. It has got to go. It's just completely insane. And but that's what we have. I mean, if you go to Washington D.C. now and you say, "Hey, all the all the folks who are studying Russia policy, raise your hand," and three quarters of the room will raise their hand. Who's studying China? Nobody. Nobody. And it's a structural issue. How big of a reversal on Trump's foreign policy, which is frankly my favorite part of his presidency? How big of a reversal is Joe Biden, or do we think he's going to be? I understand Obama was a disaster in every possible way, foreign policy-wise. But has Trump been so successful on some fronts that the next guy can't just come in and turn it all on the dime? Trump could reverse everything Obama did because everything Obama did sucked. Biden can't really do that, right, or can he? No, I mean, of course he can. Um, the first thing to remember is the, uh, the, the peace treaties that happened in... Uh, in, in the Middle East, we're, we're sort of done with the strong disapproval of kind of smart set foreign policy thinking. You know, the, the, the Biden people don't like this one bit. Why don't they like it? They don't like it because these peace treaties solidified the alliances between our, the, you know, the traditional US allies and one another. So this is something that the Obama administration worked very hard to break down. So the last time around, they spent a lot of time degrading our alliances with Saudi Arabia and UAE and Israel and Egypt and, and, and trying to elevate um, Iran and Turkey. So now what's going to happen is that, that, will, will, that will flip. And, and I think, unfortunately, an Obama administration will see... Uh, we'll see these folks in the Middle East now start to, um, you know, maybe start to panic. Maybe start to panic. I think it's, I think it's entirely. I don't want to say anything crazy and wild, but I don't think it's inconceivable to see, uh, you know, joint Arab-Israeli strike on a, on, uh, on some uh, Iranian facility before Donald Trump is out of office because he knows that they have his back. And, you know, God knows what will happen under, under Biden. Yeah, these things matter. Sometimes a lot. History says so. Dave Reboy, thank you so much, my brother. I appreciate you. You too. We got more. Hang on. Joining me now, I, I need him today, my friend Drew Berkowitz. He's the host of This Is My Show with Drew Berkowitz, and he's also a former counterterrorism agent. Gosh, I love saying that. Drew, actually, we're going to focus on your area of expertise here first today. I am doing this thing where I'm trying to, trying to wrap my mind around what exactly a Biden presidency means, what it won't mean if he ends up pulling this thing off. Let's focus on Islamic terrorism for a moment. Focusing on Obama's. What was Obama's versus Trump's? And give us some details on it. What did they believe differently? Well, I mean, when, when Obama came into power, 
you know, what we saw in particularly in the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and also the Horn of Africa, too, with with extremist groups that were there is is the handcuffs went on and, and the relationships with those host countries or partner countries in the region changed dramatically. And it became very apologetic for how how strong and powerful America was, as opposed to, you know, under, you know, Bush, which, again, there's complaints about Bush and then it's 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 been significantly better under Trump. Like, look, we are powerful. We're here to help. We're going to take care of you bad guys. We're going to help you local governments uh, create a safer environment. But what happened under Obama and Biden's administration, and I presume what happened again, is they go in with this very apologetic thing. These countries don't want us there to disrupt things too much. The people get confused. You know, our, our operational um, capabilities get significantly dwindled down to the point where, you know, under under Obama, he and Karzai had worked something out where there was uh, basically what you're seeing in America now with this no-knock stuff. You'd have to call out to the extremists before you came in, like, hey, arm yourself, destroy the cell phones and the laptops, go ahead and set that IED so it's ready to go, and then we'll come in. Like, I mean, the rules were absolutely insane uh, to the point where a lot of people were disenfranchised and, and didn't know why we were there anymore. Drew, who makes that call? And now, obviously, I, I understand that flows from the top, like under Barack Obama. It's not surprising he would take more of a <clears throat> anti-American stance when it comes to that. But who sets that kind of policy? Are these radical people they put around him? And if you can't tell, I'm trying to cope with maybe Biden will have someone around him that's OK, that'll let him know that's really stupid. Well, I mean, it's obviously, it's it's never just the guy. It's you know, it's 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 always it's always the people around them. You know, in any any given country overseas, you're going to have the CIA station chief who who dictates a lot of what goes on in that country. You're going to have your higher ranking generals if it's a, if it's, you know if it's Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, but the station chief has a lot to say with things. State Department, for some reason, when it comes to stuff like that, has some to say, um, which is again, uh, Pompeo has been great, but typically. They're a very, very, very different mission, very pacifist. Um, so, I, you know, it, 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 the culture is set from the top and it, and it flows down. You know, we, hey, we don't want to we don't want to make any we don't want to make any ripples or waves here. And, and then that 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 spreads and the leadership takes it and runs with it. Whereas, you know, if you've got strong leadership at these organized agencies or within, you know, different commands of the military, who someone says, hey, man, go do your job. Go go do your job. Don't let us get in the way. We sent you there for a reason. Make things happen. Uh, the, the, the morale is better. Things get done. But again, when when the president and then the people that he puts in, in positions beneath him say, well, we don't, we don't want to step on the toes of people, which is why we're kind of there, is to step on the toes of people. Um, it just, it, it becomes really, really difficult. And it's, and look, I mean, it got so politicized under the Obama Biden administration, what well, we saw change in in the intel community, and I know that we're seeing the ramifications of it now in the law enforcement, even though that's not my background, you're seeing it at all these three letter agencies where it just got really bad. Okay, I, I, it's funny, I was getting ready to ask you about that. I've never seen the FBI and CIA be as politicized as they clearly were under Barack Obama. And I am not here to defend the history of the FBI. Don't be sending me emails screaming about Ruby Ridge and Waco. I, I, I get it. I, I, I understand. But as far as really, really going all in politically, they appear to be left-leaning organizations weaponized. How did that happen? Did Obama get there and fire a bunch of people and hire his own people? Were they always leftists and I just didn't see it? How did that happen? Uh, well, I, I can't speak specifically to the FBI. I, I mean, I know they wear suits. That looks uncomfortable. I don't like wearing suits. Um, <laughs> but they, look, I mean, it, it did. It went really far left under them. And, and CIA and, and a lot of other organizations did as well under the Obama leadership because you do. You you appoint people to run those organizations. You know, some, sometimes you have holdovers and you keep them there. But you t traditionally, you appoint who you want there. And the careerists that rise up within those organizations typically are just not good. Like people who rise to power in there who are all about themselves, not the mission. Your 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 agents, if it's FBI, your your intel officers on the CIA side or, or DIA or NSA, what have you, are are in it for the right reasons for the vast, vast majority of the time. And but the people that kind of rise to the top are your Kamala Harris types that are willing to do anything 
um, to get to the top and they care about them. Um, so, I, you know, when you foster that culture and you foster, you know, at the agency, for example, what you would see is you would see under that administration, rather than focusing big time, well, by the way, we were fighting two wars and had national security threats out the wazoo on a daily basis. There was all of this new cultural stuff happening there, which is fine. I don't care. I don't care what you call yourself, what you do. If you change your name from Brendan to Diane, like do whatever you want to do. But all of these groups were started. There was a huge emphasis on on changing and, and the culture there and appeasing things. Like, I thought we were just here to, to kill bad guys and keep the country safe. Um, that's, that's what I signed up for. So lots of that stuff changed. But once you go down that path, of course, you're an awful person or awful leaders if you start to retract some of that stuff and say, hey, let's focus on what we're here to focus and what the taxpayers are paying us to do. So I think it kind of went that direction. And then it went so far that it's just, again, you can't reel it back. Domestically, I, I, I don't, I don't see how faith gets put back in, Drew. The, the problem is with this election stuff, voter fraud, not voter fraud, whatever it may be. We don't know how extensive it is right now, but we've gotten to the point where half the country doesn't even care. You're never going to convince the majority of the right this wasn't stolen simply for how it looks. And maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. We're, we're have to wait for the evidence to come out. But it looks so bad. How's that band get put back together? We're going to have four years of the right saying, not my president, aren't we? Yeah, I think unfortunately. I think unfortunately you've seen, unless something drastic is done and as you said some evidence comes out here we've seen the last election that we trust the results of and we're going to have way more division than we did remarkably going into this election because you didn't think that was possible and the same thing holds true for for all of these these organizations you know no one's gonna you don't you don't get that kind of trust back it's really easy to lose trust it's really hard to gain it back um and with with FBI, all of our different national security apparatus uh, organizations, I, it's going to be real. I, I really don't know how we as a country come out of this okay on a number of levels. It's, it's, it's going to be really, really tough. I keep hearing from people who are, you know, trying to make it better. And maybe this, look, we can take some solace in the fact that we might have the Senate now with Georgia up in there. We might not have the Senate, but we might have the Senate, I, I guess. People are saying the GOP is going to put a stop on the major things. Do you believe that? I, I don't know if I believe that. No, the GOP is, if there's one thing that you can count on the GOP for, yeah. it's getting walked over by the Democrats. They get absolutely annihilated by them. They have no backbone. They, and I look, we're, you know, we're conservatives. The audience here is conservative. Like, but, but, but the reality is the reality. And we have let these people walk all over us for far too long. Why, why should we believe anything else is going to happen? There are some louder voices now stepping up and saying, we can't stand for this and we need answers. And but OK, but when will you quiet down? And, and, and you can expect not many others around them to do the same. It's, I, I expect more of the same, which unfortunately is the Dems having their way because we don't have the backbone to, to push back. Who's the leader of this party? Is it your boy, Ron DeSantis, over there? I like what I see, Drew, but I'm not in Florida. I don't know enough about him. I like a lot of what I see, man. Yeah, I, I, I think he's, well, and, 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 and side point, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of people that people presumed could be the next tranche of leaders in the GOP who are silent right now and show that they care more about their career than they do figuring out what's actually going on with this, and I think that's pretty telling. But I think DeSantis is interesting. He's, he's I mean, Look, I don't think he's as charismatic. The, the, the tough thing is, is it's like, you know, you lose a great football coach to retirement or, God forbid, to death. You never want to be that guy who takes over afterwards. The enthusiasm and excitement for Trump has been so crazy that whoever's next, they're going to look like they're just the most flat, boring person ever, which is not necessarily true. It's just how the comparison is going to look. So I think Ron is really impressive. I think that he doesn't have the pizzazz, but I think he's a heck of a leader. He's done a remarkable job. I mean, look, Florida had this thing called so quickly, so well. We've handled COVID so well. So I think that there's a lot of things that you can point to and say, that's leadership. Drew Berquist, host of This Is My Show. Drew Berquist, thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. All right. We need some levity, don't we? It's Friday. It's Friday night. We're about to give you some hilarious video. Hang on. I know 
You've been drowning yourself in election coverage. We all have. And I know how confusing elec election coverage can be. That's why Buck Sexton and I did our election night show the way we did. You notice we didn't drown you in charts and graphs and this county and that county and things like that because it's mind-numbing. You don't know what they're talking about. And they act like you're the expert too. So I saw this guy do this parody video online and I just about died laughing. Sit back and enjoy. Ohio's important. Everyone knows Ohio's important. You're going to go down here in the valley between Columbus and Pittsburgh. And then you got the Aikman Triangle right here. Hillary Clinton carried this next to Canton. And then there's, of course, there's Wooster. But in 1876, it was a different story. Orville. This is a problem for Orville. This is a problem for Biden. Trump carries these North Lawrence down over here, to, up here to Canal Fulton. You're going to zoom in. You're going to zoom in and get up here to 9321 Triangle Circle. That's what they call it, right around Nickajack Farms. Everyone knows that Nickajack Farms has always been carried Trump ever since 1884 when he only won 42 of the vote. We're going to go south. We're going to head our way south. We're going to zoom in a little bit. Right there, there's a green patch. We call this Elms Country Club. Back in the day, Elms Country Club is where, of course, Hamilton lost the duel with Washington. Everyone knows this is a huge Republican mainstay. We're going to back up a little bit. I never stop talking. I always just keep moving the map. We need more data. Of course, there's East Canton. East Canton, of course, runs east of Canton, which is just east of Massillon. And then Massillon's north of Nevers. And we all know that these are Republican hotspots. Perry Heights, Biden, exiting polls say that the 620 is backed up here all the way down to 77. I never stopped talking. I was told to keep talking. Never stop talking. Keep moving the map. Everyone knows about East Sparta. But let me remind you because East Sparta carries the... Oh, gosh. There are some seriously funny people out there. All right, keep your chin up. See you Monday.